more than just being a, a sermon about cosmology and globe versus the round earth, what I'd like to bring out here is some principles about how we read the Bible and how we are to have faith in the Bible. We can be faithful stewards, rightly divide the word of truth, or we can spiritualize the word according to our own inclinations and our inconvenience. That's the only way that can be done. So before we begin, we're going to have a look at some of the rules of interpretation. Now, these are some uh, wise counsels and by William Miller, the faithful Bible student of the 19th century, who we're all very familiar with. Rule 11 here, how to know when a word is used figuratively. And the rule says, if it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. So here's a principle we read. And really, it's just good common sense. Any person of balanced judgment would come to this conclusion naturally. You know, like there's no, you know, it, 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 almost, it goes without saying. However, the, the Ten Commandments, they also go without saying, don't they? Thou shalt not kill, steal, commit adultery, don't, you know, all these things go without saying. But because people break them, it's necessary to stipulate such rules. And I like what he, what he says there. If it does no violence to the simplest nature, then it must be understood literally. You have no excuse to spiritualize something that is, is, does no violence to the laws of nature. Now, we read, we th read things in prophecy about a beast with seven heads and ten horns and horns, uh, horns with human features speaking. Obviously, that breaks the laws of nature. You know, that, that's clearly symbolic and figurative. Uh, <clears throat> However, unless it breaks the simple laws, we're not talking about gravitons and Newton's laws of physics. We're talking about simple common sense things that, ev that everyone can understand. They must be taken literally. God is not out to trick people. He's not out to deceive. And he doesn't. Um, he makes things clear when they're symbolic and when they're literal. And we have this counsel by Sister White. The language of the Bible should be explained according to its obvious meaning unless a symbol or figure is employed. Uh, very similar to what William Miller said. So unless you see a symbol or a figure, the, the server, obvious reading is, is the way to, to, to interpret. Now, in the, within the Godhead movement, people are, are generally faithful to this rule. That's what makes them... The, the fact that they're able to humbly accept what the Bible, how the Bible reads makes them what they are. It's this, it's this trait that's in them that makes people Godhead believers. When they read a verse and they, they take it literally, they're able to take it literally. As we know, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, the, what, is this, what is the simple and obvious meaning when we read this, this text? That God gave his only begotten Son. That word only begotten means only born. We see there monogenes. It means child. So what we can gather from this is that Jesus had a birth, therefore he had a beginning of days, and his father predates him. His father is older than him. This is the obvious uh, conclusion you come to where it says only begotten. There's, that's, that's, the, that's the reading of this verse in, in the, only, the only honest way you can read this verse. And that he's the only. There's, only, there's none, none else like him. Okay, and it's clear. A child can understand this. Again, this on the same subject, John 8, 42, Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, ye would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. So that word proceedeth forth, it's exocomai. It means to issue, to proceed forth. And, that, and then he says that I proceed forth and came from God. His, his and came from God is talking about his coming to this world. So there's two actions there. The proceeding forth is when he literally came from his father's very being. Just like a human child comes from its parents, from their DNA and from the mother's own substance, Jesus proceeded forth from his father's person. This is the, this is the honest way of reading these texts. And Jesus says this again in many places. But here in John 16, 27, we read, For the father himself loveth you, because ye have loved me, and believe that I came out, ex from God. 
So we get from that that God loves us when we believe this truth. He, he loves you anyway, but he, he has a special regard when you accept how his word is written. But the Trinitarian theologian, Max Hatton, in his book about the Trinity, Understanding the Trinity, he says, the Bible doesn't mean that. He says, the father-son relationship in the Godhead should be understood in a metaphorical sense, not in a literal sense. He's saying it's not real. He's not really a son. It's metaphorical. Is there anything in the language of these verses to, to suggest that? No, there's not. So why does he do that? Does he have any verses in support? There's no verse. The reason they do this is because this, uh, this, this teaching of Jesus being a literal son conflicts with their, their belief in the Trinity. That's the only reason. So they have to reject it solely for that reason, not because of there's any evidence for it, because they realize in so doing they would have to, they would have to put away their, their teaching of the Trinity. <clears throat> because the Trinity teaches that uh, it's, it's a unity of three co-eternal beings, they're all the same age, and they all have no beginning, which, which Jesus being a son of God is in total uh, conflict with. So they reject it for that on those grounds. What's that, that, what's that called? Spiritualizing. Spiritualizing plain truth. And th we see again, another quote we're familiar with, uh, Gordon Jensen, he says, A plan of salvation was encompassed in the covenant made by the three persons of the Godhead who possess the attributes of deity equally. There we go, these, these uh, all the same age, co-eternal, co etc. In order to eradicate sin and rebellion from the universe and restore harmony and peace, one of the divine beings, not a son, they're just one of, of, of three beings that are all the same, accepted and entered into the role of the Father and another the role of the Son. So, this sterile example of three beings that have no relation to each other are just playing roles. They're just pretending. They're just pretending to be a father and a son. It's all make believe. I don't know if anyone else has heard, but this this concept that oh, they put it in terms so that we on earth could understand it. You know, because we we have fathers and sons, and you know, it's just. But they're not really a father and son. It's just just putting in an our language. That's what they say. And that's what some people say about the other thing we're going to talk about. So they reject the word of God to maintain their belief in the Trinity. Jesus is not a son and the father is not a father. It's all metaphorical. And where, are the, where did the Adventist church get this teaching from? It comes from Rome. Rome has the exact same teaching as we see here. The diagram, one on the left is a, is a Catholic version of the Trinity and the one on the right is an Adventist, uh, in an Adventist publication. They're the exact same belief, and the, the Adventists got it from Rome. It's the same teaching. It's no different. The reason I'm talking about this is I'm trying to bring out a principle here. So rejecting plain truths, like we just saw about Jesus being the literal son of God, for philosophical notions, has its repercussions. It doesn't end there. It always has a repercussion and effect upon... Uh, many other things in your theology and your conception of God and heaven and the universe. Now, one thing about the Catholic Church, where the Trinity comes from, is that actually is commendable. Their theology is systematic, and it, it, um, it, all, all their teachings corroborate with, it, with each other. They're all wrong, but they actually corroborate with each other. The Adventist Church, because they have truth and error mixed together, they don't, they don't mesh with each other. But the Catholic Church has most of their teachings, or if not all of them, I actually can't think of any at all. Like especially if you think about the Godhead, the nature of Christ, um, state of the dead, think about uh, prophecy. I, I can't think of anything. But how? In, but it's commendable that they actually all work together, and they have systematic theology. Just moving on from the the Catholic belief in the Trinity, we're going to. When we're going to see how the Catholic Church, what conclusions they make based upon that belief in the Trinity. One question you've got to ask, can a trying God have a physical body? Is that possible? And you see in the picture there, well, you have some kind of three-headed God. You know, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. Unlike the Adventist Church who believe in the Trinity, the Catholic Church in their consistent theology, they come out right out and say, God has no body, as you see in the Catholic Answers. Um, 
The Church Fathers, of course, agreed, according to this Catholic theologian, and loudly declared the fact that God is an unchangeable, immaterial spirit who has an entirely simple or in composite nature, they say. That is a nature containing no parts. Since all bodies stand through space and thus can be divided into parts, it is clear that God cannot have a body, they say. So, uh, you know, they don't really give any scripture here, but they're saying God has no body. But it's, it's, it makes sense because of the Trinity. You know, Trinity can't have a body. And, and it's actually in another article on this website I found explaining the Trinity by this uh, theologian, Tim Staples. He actually quotes Augustine, who's the father of many of Catholic teachings. And then he draws his conclusions from what Augustine wrote. He says, we believe in, a, in one true God, Yahweh, who is absolute being, absolute perfection, and absolutely simple. Our belief in the Trinity does not mean God is three or any number of gods. So they're saying it's one God, but it's a Trinity somehow, which is you know, obviously impossible. So they believe in one God, and the second belief, which is which is uh, branches out from that first belief. This whole second paragraph is basically God has no body, but he, he sorts probably it's like humankind is created in God's image. From the context of Genesis one, we know this image and likeness does not pertain to the body of man, because God has no body. See that their their preface their prem, their false premise is there that God has no body, but God does have a body, and we are made in His image and likeness. Our body is in the image of his body. So, so anyway, can you see how the, the, the belief that God has, has no body hinges off the first belief in the Trinity? So let's see now, let's ask them, is a Catholic church, is heaven a physical place? Since God is a Trinity and has no body, since he's a, a spirit dwelling in some kind of ethereal realm, can heaven really be a, a literal place in like, you know, because God, we know God is in heaven. This is the Pope says, heaven is a place within God, says Pope. So heaven is not a literal place. It's a place within God. Heaven is not a location in the cosmos, but a place within God. Pope Benedict has said. He says there, um, celebrating early morning mass. Um, the Pope said that when the Catholic Church affirms that Mary was taken body and soul into heaven, it is not referring to some place in the universe or, st or a star or something like that. Our serenity, hope and peace is based precisely in this, in God, in his thoughts and in his love we will survive. So heaven is a place in God's thoughts and in his love. It's not a literal, tangible place, uh, according to the Pope. And he says, the bottom paragraph there, God is love and what defeats the power of death, it brings eternal life. And it is, in, it is this love that we call heaven. So heaven is love. Heaven is, is in God's thoughts and stuff. So you see, remember this all goes back to the Trinity because, because God is an is a, is a immaterial spirit that dwells. You know, he doesn't have a physical body and therefore heaven can't be a physical place because he's not a physical being and he can't have it a physical place. Talk about how uh, the, 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 what they say, the Trinity is the, the mystery of the Holy Trinity is the central mystery and the source of all other mysteries. It truly really is. Anyway, but that's not what the Bible says. That's, we, we see that that came from the Trinity and the, the Catholic Church follows that to its right conclusion. So God does have a physical body and it is in a material place. If you read in Daniel 7, I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands and thousands minutes unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousand stood before him, and judgment was set, and books were opened. So here, this is the judgment scene we're seeing. Now the books were opened, there's literal books there. And there's people standing before him. I'm just reading from the bottom up. And then we read the, the wheels and his throne. That's a literal throne he's, he's got there. And his head and his hair and his garment and he sits. So you see there God sitting. He therefore must have a body. He sits on a throne. God does have a body according to scripture. This is, it's true, true this is a vision, but it's a vision of, of, of a real scene that is, that is taking place. And again, we, we're going to see now where 
that throne is, is in Revelation 4. John speaking now, he says, And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. So God's throne is in heaven, and he sits on that throne. God is in heaven, and he has a body. There's many other places in the Scripture that talk about this. Isaiah 65, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the, for and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. And they shall build houses, inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So in heaven, it's, it's such a material place, according to the Bible, this is the new earth that God creates, that houses will be built by the saints, and, the, and they will plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. So you'll be building and planting in heaven. It's, you know, the, the Bible really uh, describes it in a way that you can, you can imagine yourself being there, and he, God wants us to think that. And like Jesus says, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. He wants us to know that there it is a real place. Only when we know this can we really lay up treasure in heaven. If, 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 if heaven is a place in the thoughts and love of God, you can't really imagine yourself there because it's, it's a very confusing concept. But when we, when, that's why Jesus said things like this. So we can actually place ourselves there. So we really can lay up treasure in heaven. That's why he says these things. The inverse, or making heaven a intangible and um, whimsical place, causes one would cause you to lay up treasures on earth because it actually it's actually something you can you can sort of comprehend. Let's just summarize this here in a second before I go on to the next um, topic. So, Trinitarian theology, which we saw was a spiritualized reading of Scripture says that God has no physical form, which therefore means that God cannot dwell in a material place because he has no physical form. And then heaven therefore becomes some intangible place in God. Non-Trinitarian theology we saw with this, it's, it's not solely non-Trinitarian, but we're talking about a literalist uh, reading of scripture. God has a physical form, therefore he, can, he does dwell in a material place. And heaven is a tangible place with God. You see the, the repercussions of a correct interpretation of, you know, of God, God's being and his person. And like I began with, this, this uh, way of reasoning or this, this honest and reading of the Bible is what makes Godhead believers what they are. It's what um, has made them come out of, of error, of the error of the Trinity, into the truth. Is just taking the Bible as it reads, having the courage to do that. But... Are we willing to take that method all the way? Are Godhead believers willing to have the courage to take that method all the way? And remembering our rule, if it makes good sense as it stands and does no violence to the simple laws of nature, then it must be understood literally, if not figuratively. David, in Psalm 139, states, Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? He's talking about the omnipresence of God, that you can't get away from him. And now he, he to, to illustrate that point that you cannot get away from God, he speaks of the two extremes of the universe. He says, here, if I ascend into heaven, behold, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Can you see the two extremes of David's universe are heaven and hell. Up, and he knows that word up, ascend up into heaven. Heaven has a direction. It is above this earth. And hell obviously is below. And literally a 90 degree direction above the earth. And he says there, hell. That word hell, it means the grave. It means a few things. But I believe that as the Bible talks about it, as there is literally a heaven above the earth, below the earth there is literally, I believe there's a literal place. Um not just where the, I'm not talking about a place where the dead inhabit, like because we know that the, there is no consciousness after death. But when you read in, in Scripture, we read about this verse in, in Luke, about the demons that, that um, Jesus cast out of the demoniacs. It says in verse 31 there that they besought him that he would, not, he would not command them to go out into the deep. So there's clearly a literal place where at least the demons inhabit in, under the earth. Because that's the only way you can understand these, these passages. 
the deep that, that we know that there's a great deep of waters under the earth whether that's just what it is i'm not sure so there's we're talking about literal places here so in this belief in the globe up or above is is not one direction in 24 hours it's a 360 degree direction so you cannot employ the language above or above the earth and it's different um, depending upon where you are on the earth it's not it's not in this in, in one place which is is not it doesn't work with the with the way the bible describes it and we're going to we're going to see many verses that describe it this way what the the rendering of these of these texts that we're going to read according to the globe believer they have to spiritualize these texts they have to make them uh, figurative or not literal and we saw we saw the way that the um the catholic church does that and what it leads to and the globe is actually very much a belief in the globe is actually very much in harmony with that methodology because we see in this in this uh, diagram here we've got the first heaven is the earth atmosphere apparently the second heaven the bible talks about is the, is the outer space and the third heaven is a spiritual universe so you like just similar to what the pope said about being a place in god or something now i know that many would not don't believe in that in that heaven is a spiritual universe they believe maybe it's a, a place in some constellation somewhere however there's problems with that too because that's certainly not directly above the earth and and and, and you, you'd want to ask perhaps is that like we know that the earth is moving and the planets are all moving and the sun's moving or apparently does that mean that heaven is also shooting around space you know these are the sort of things you've got to think about with that model that just the more you look at this the the globe model does not fit at all with scripture it's a big bang and evolutionary model it only fits with that and the only way you can harmonize scripture with the globe model is through spiritualizing like the catholic church does with the trinity and the adventist church does with the trinity it's the same mentality i'm just going to play a short clip by neil degrasse tyson and just to show a little bit of um Actually, what he says is very true, so we'll just watch it. People who make this case that that was the beginning and that there had to be something that provoked the beginning, do you give them an A at least for trying to reconcile faith and reason? Um, I don't think they're reconcilable. What do you mean? Well, well, so let me say that differently. All efforts that have been invested by brilliant people of the past have failed at that exercise. They just fail. And so I don't, I, I don't, the track record is so poor that going forward I have essentially zero confidence, near zero confidence, that there will be fruitful things to emerge from the effort to reconcile them. So, for example, if you, if you knew nothing about science and you read, say, the Bible, the Old Testament, which in Genesis is an account of nature, that's, that's what that is, and I said to you, give me your description of the natural world based only on this. You would say the world was created in six days and that stars are just little points of light, much lesser than the sun. And in fact, they can fall out of the sky, right? Because that's what happens during, during the um, revelation. One of the signs that yeah. the second coming is that the stars will fall out of the sky and land on earth. So it's even right that means you don't know what those things are. You have no concept of what the actual universe is. So everybody who tried to make proclamations about the physical universe based on Bible passages got the wrong answer. So what happened was when science discovers things and you want to stay religious or you want to continue to believe that the Bible is, is unerring, what you would do is you would say, well, let me go back to the Bible and reinterpret it. Then you say things like, oh, they didn't really mean that literally, they meant that figuratively. So this whole sort of reinterpretation of the fig how figurative the poetic passages of the Bible are came after science showed that this is not how things unfolded. And so the educated religious people are perfectly fine with that. It's the fundamentalists who want to say that the Bible is the literally literal truth of God 
that and want to see the Bible as a science textbook who are knocking on the science doors of the schools trying to put that content in the science. Uh, enlightened religious people are not behaving that way. They're saying, yes, yeah, science is cool, we're good with that, and use the Bible for, to get your spiritual enlightenment and your emotional fulfillment. So you saw what he said there about how the figurative interpretation of those things came after. After science discovered that, you know, stars were giant balls of gas and millions of light years away, etc. And he said that, you know, it's true what he said. Those who want to hold that the Bible is the literal truth of God are fundamentalists. And um, I really, um, I'm quite, I'm quite uh, fascinated with that term fundamentalist that's come out. Like, I really think that that's a, this is one of these labels they brought out to, to strike fear into the hearts of those who would take, have the courage to actually stand upon principles of the Bible. It's got a, uh, um, it's almost synonymous with terrorism as well. It's synonymous with terrorism. And the definition of that word from this uh, dictionary is a system of beliefs based on the interpretation of every word in the Bible, both Old and New Testaments as literal truth. It is primarily held by a branch of American Protestants. So, um, do you believe that the, the, every word of the Bible is literal truth? Oh, I do. Well, there are some things that are symbolic, obviously, you know, but that's not, that's, that's not how I read that. It's, all, it's still tr literal truth. It's just, it's just a prophecy or something. It takes courage in this day and age, as it has in all ages, to, to believe unpopular truths in the Bible, to take the Bible literally, because it isolates you. It, uh, it separates you from others. You declare a fundamentalist. Interestingly, the word fundamental in the, bi in the dictionary, these are some of the, the synonyms, bottom line, cornerstone, foundation, law, principle. See, fundamental is a good word. Like I, I think we, we feel the Ten Commandments are a fundamental part of Christianity. Commands us to, to love each other. That's a fundamental truth of the Bible. There's nothing wrong with being fundamental. So being a fundamentalist is a good thing you know, in, in reality, but in the world's eyes, it's not, it's a, you're, a, you're an outcast and a, anyway. But take a look at some of the antonyms for the word fundamental. What's the first one there? Cowardice, fear. And really, these are the reasons why people reject the, some, many of the fundamental truths of the Bible, such as it, the Godhead truth. Because it's, it's more convenient to be a Trinitarian because most people are Trinitarian. And it's also very inconvenient to believe in the flat earth because you know, people tend to really attack you for it. Okay. So we're just going to go through some of these verses in the Bible and show, uh, show the, the literalness of them. And, and I just want you to think about the ramifications this has on the way you understand heaven and understand God or anyone who comes to believe them. Just the difference in, in the way of thinking, that the, the beautiful revelation it is to take these verses literally. Okay, let's see what Moses had to say. Says. We're just going to see from different Bible writers the same thing. Know therefore this day, and consider in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. So we see God is heaven above and earth beneath. Rahab, the same thing speaking to the spies in Jericho. And soon, as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you, for the Lord your God, he is in heaven above and in earth beneath. Solomon, there is no God like thee in heaven above or in earth beneath. And just, just so you might think, oh, well, that's the, the, you know, the, the thoughts of them where they had in their times. But God himself says the same thing. In the Ten Commandments, he says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath. There's no license in any of this to take it um, uh, symbolically or literally, uh, figuratively, according to our rule. And now we read about the Tower of Babel. This is what the, the wicked said. They said, Go to, let us build a city whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the whole earth. So the, the tower is going to reach unto heaven. They had an object to reach. 
whether it was the firmament or actually where God is. I'm not sure. But what did the Lord say? And the Lord came down and came down. He came down from heaven, literally down. And in verse 7, he said, go to let us go down. So God is again coming down, we see. People are taken up into heaven as Elijah was. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elijah from Gilgal. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. He literally went up. He didn't go into space and into orbit like the supposed rockets do. He went up into heaven. We're going to see where heaven is in a, in a little bit. Jesus in his ascension. And when they had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of his heart, literally taken up. We're going to see some verses now about heaven being opened. Now just think about it for a second. On a globe, can heaven open? Because heaven in the, to the globe believer is, is nothing. It's, it's just a, it's, it's, it's a void of, of gases maybe. and can't open. And it just goes on for millions of light years of nothing. But on the, on the biblical model, we see there the firmament. The firmament is a solid thing. A, a solid thing can open like a door opens. It has to be solid. For something to open, it has to be of, of material. It cannot be just a void. Read some verses here. Jesus' baptism. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lightning, lighting upon him. So he saw the, the heavens were open and he saw the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God came through that opening because God is literally above this earth. And lo, a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. That voice came from the throne of God through that opening in heaven that was made. In the book of Acts, at the stoning of Stephen, we read here, And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth after he gave that wonderful sermon that, that, that uh, convicted so many. He says, and, but he being full of the Holy Ghost looks up steadfastly into heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. So heaven opened and he was able to look into heaven and see not only Jesus, but the Father. The Father was sitting down, obviously, and Jesus was standing on his right hand. He saw straight into heaven, which was above the earth. And there's no reason we have to spiritualize and say, oh, you know, he just, heaven's really moons of light years away, you know. There's nothing in these verses to suggest that. The honest reading is to take it as it is. It's literally up there. And we see even the Lord himself in John 17 in his prayer to his disciples. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify thy son thy son also may glorify thee. So Jesus himself, if anyone knew that heaven was a million light years away and that was, we, were, we were really spinning around and you know, it, would be, it would be the son of God, but he looks as, as though he's speaking to God. He looks into the sky as though he's just above the, above the clouds there. It's a really comforting thought. Next time you're out there, maybe just look up, look up at the blue sky and imagine... Imagine the heaven is literally above that. You, know, you can imagine the, the feelings Jesus would have had when he, when he lifted up his eyes to look into heaven, to know his father was, was, was out of sight. He could see him by faith because he believed what the Bible says about where heaven is, that he could, he could be looking directly at where God is. <clears throat> and let's just have a look at the, the vision of Ezekiel quickly here. It shows this, this shows probably more clearly than any other text in the Bible where God is, that he's literally above this earth. It's quite an um, in-depth vision, so I took verses out of it because reading it would take a long time. But you get the idea. Verse 4, he says, I looked and behold, and a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. What Ezekiel sees here, I'm going to describe as an angelic chariot, for lack of a better word. It's, it's got wheels in wheels, and it's got fire and faces and wings. Anyway, so this is what happens. 
It came out of the north. I'm just going to illustrate the movements of this article here. The next verse says, Now as I behold the living creatures, one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. So now this living, this, this angel chariot has gone to the earth and it's, its one wheel is actually touching the earth. Now skipping down to verse 19, we read, And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them and the living creatures were lifted up from the earth. The wheels were lifted up. So now this thing is no longer on the earth, it's lifted up, we can see. A crude illustration of what Ezekiel is actually seeing. Now skipping to verse 22, we read, And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. So now we see over the top of them, just directly above them, is the firmament. We know that Bible describes as that solid dome. And what happens next? And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. So there's a voice coming from above them where that firmament is. And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness, the appearance of a man above it. So above the firmament, which was above these angels, was the throne of God. So directly above the firmament, above this earth, that is where the throne of God is. And what effect did this have on, on Ezekiel? This is, I believe, the, re the reason for this vision. Like, the reason for this vision is God wants to impress upon you that the angels are at work constantly. God has, God has, has um, very uh, powerful agencies at work on this earth. That, that you know, the description of them is, is terrible and glorious. But he also wants to impress upon us that he is literally above this earth. That's, that's what I believe the, the whole point of this vision was. And it's to, to, bring, to bring it, strike a healthy fear into the, to your heart and, and to recognize that God truly is involved in our lives. As he says here, Ezekiel, and the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so is the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. So when you recognize that God is literally above this earth, it has an effect on you. You know, it certainly would make you consider your ways, I would believe. That's, that's one thing that this, this whole globe model has done. It's, it's just banished God off into, into light years of space if he even exists. But we see that the Hebrews believe that God was literally above this earth. And, and, and they fell on their knees when they, when they recognize that fact. Another important point is, is we, we just heard that the voice came from above the firmament. And that voice of God... Um, it's something that's spoken about quite a lot in the Bible. And it really, um, I saw some interesting things here about it. Anyway, in uh, Hebrews, Apostle Paul says that, For ye are not come into the mount that might be touched, that burned with fire, nor into blackness and darkness and tempest. What was the mount that burnt with fire? Yeah, mount Sinai, right? It burnt with fire. And, you, know, uh, you see there the graphic, the people were very afraid. And the sound of a trumpet and the words of the voice of words, which voice they heard, entreated that that word should not be spoken to them anymore. They said, let God, not God speak to us lest we die. They were afraid of this voice. It's a very um, frightening thing, the voice of God. And that voice is going to be heard again. Whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. So that voice that shook the earth at, at the Mount Sinai is going to shake not only the earth, but the heavens also. It's going to shake the earth and the heavens together. That voice of God, we read about here, spoken about many places. I'm just going to, I just picked a few. In Joel 3.16, the Lord shall roar out of Zion. His voice is described as a roar. And shall utter his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shall shake but the Lord will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Israel. So this, this is to strike terror into the earth. This is going to happen right at the end, and we're going to show when it happens. So out of Zion, out of Jerusalem, talking about heavenly Jerusalem, which we know is above this earth. And, and uh, we read here in Psalm 68, To him that rideth upon the heavens of heavens, which were of old, lo, he doth send out his voice, and that a mighty voice. So that voice out of Zion that shakes the earth, comes out of heaven, which we just saw is above this earth. Another thing about it, Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord is upon 
meant the waters. And we know that the heaven is, is actually sitting on waters above the, if you see in the graphic there, the, the, the great deep, the waters above the firmament. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The God of glory thundereth the Lord is upon many waters. The Lord sitteth upon the flood. Yea, the Lord is, sitteth king forever. God is sitting upon waters up there. And that voice in Isaiah 34 here, it says here, I believe this is when God utters that voice. It says, And the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heaven shall be rolled together as a scroll, and the host shall fall down as a leaf falleth from the vine, and as a, fig, as a falling fig from the tree. So when God utters this voice, all the host shall fall down. What are the host of heaven? The stars, the stars, the, the moon. This, these things will fall down. Now, it says all their hosts. You know, some people interpret this as meteorites or meteor shower. But it says all their hosts shall fall down. The only way you can take that is that the stars literally fall from heaven. The science tells us that the stars, our sun is only a small star. And, you know, the, the sun is like, I don't know how many thousand times bigger than Earth. Let's have a look at the sixth trumpet here. Revelation 6.12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. I believe that earthquake is, is triggered by the voice of God. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her to untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So this great earthquake shakes heaven also. The stars even fall to the earth. Okay, and the heaven departed as a scroll, as we saw before, the heaven rolled together, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Now, again, this doesn't really make sense with just an atmosphere rolling together, or, or it doesn't make sense with just, just air and void, but rather something solid, as we saw heaven open before, and God was seen through the space. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens of the rocks of the mountains. If there was an earthquake happening, would you really want to go into a cave? No, I don't think I'd really. But they actually want the rocks and to fall upon them. There's something terrifies them more than, than, than an earthquake or even than the, than, than the stars falling. And we see what it is here. And said unto the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why do they describe God as sitting on a throne? They can see him. The heaven has opened and they can see into heaven and they can see him just like Stephen did and see through that open firmament. They can see God sitting on, the, on his throne. He's always been up there. And they see the wrath of the Lamb. They see the, ram, the Lamb as well standing with Him. So can you see the uh, ramifications? Now, now, now the, the wicked who have been in rebellion for you know, most of their lives here, and especially at the end there, have been fighting against God. And now they, the heavens finally open and they see Him sitting on the throne and they're reduced to you know, total fear and you know, submission there. They even want the rocks to fall on them. How much more would a faith in the belief that God is, is just literally up there have upon them if they believed that before, if they had, had, had understood that? I think the, 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 the globe model with putting heaven so far away has just had such a decimating effect upon how people, you know, their moral worth. Because if you knew God was just up there, I'm sure that would strike a healthy fear into your heart. Because as the Bible states, he sitteth upon the circle of the earth. He literally sits upon the top of the earth. The inhabitants are grasshoppers. So while that vision of God sitting on his throne after the sixth trumpet will strike fear into the heart of the wicked, to the godly it will be a comfort to know that God is there. And, and, it, and it is a comfort now to know when you look up at, those, at the stars or if you look up at that blue sky, the nearness of God, how close he is to us. You know, that, that this... This horrible teaching of has destroyed, and it came. Remember, it just came, it came from this spiritualizing of the Bible, this this dishonest interpretations. And you know, as God's people in the last days, we have to stand by that um, that rule that we saw William Miller wrote, and, and Ellen White said there with 
you know, unless a figure or symbol is employed, the Bible is to be taken as it reads. And that is really just having true faith in, in the Bible. So um, anyway, I'm finished. I ask you to join with me in prayer as we conclude. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the knowledge that um, you haven't left us, you haven't abandoned us, in some, in, abandoned us in some vast extent of space where we're supposedly an insignificant uh, dot, but rather you are, we are the, the apple of thine eye. We, we are, you are sitting literally enthroned upon uh, the circle of the earth above us as Ezekiel saw. Uh, you are upon your throne and you and you have charge over this world and your angels are ministering spirits to us and they run to and fro. And we thank you for this knowledge and we pray that um, it will create in us a, a more of a love for you and an appreciation that as Jesus um, look, lifted his eyes up to heaven and in faith we, we may do the same until we finally see you through that um, that when you, after you utter your voice and we see, like the wicked see you, we also hopefully, in, we, we pray, uh, we'll be faithful and, and, and not call for the rocks and mountains to fall on us, but rather say, here is our God and he who will save us, we pray. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>